everybody. Welcome to Edgy Match. Thank you so much for joining us. So follow along with us at podcasts.edumatch.org forward slash tweet talk, which you are obviously doing if you just heard me say that. But also you can follow along on Twitter with the hashtag edumatch and leave your comments. So questions are going to be dropping as we're going through. So speaking of edumatch, did you know that you could be the featured person of the day? Just go to edumatch.org. Look for the sign up button on the top right hand side. Not the one that pops up on you. That's for our mailing list. But on the top right hand side, there's a button that says sign up and that will drop you into our database of people of the day. So I'm not going to lie. It is a little bit of a weight, a lot of bit of a weight, but there are some benefits to it. Like for example, being part of our awesome table where people can find you and connect with you online. Also having your blog post tweeted out as long as we can find your RSS feed. And also when other people are uh, the person of the day, if there's a match, then uh, we will tag you. So definitely check out edumatch.org. All right. So tonight we are going to be talking about the joys of reading. Super, super excited. We have amazing folks here with us. So we're going to kick things off with introductions. Let's start with Leslie. Um, hi, my name is Leslie Fagan. I am an instructional technology coach. I have the pleasure of working with the secondary school teachers in my district on effective technology integration. I am in a town about 45 minutes south of Atlanta called Griffin. And I am excited to be here because reading is one of my, um, actually it's my only hobby. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. Super cool, Leslie. Thanks so much for joining us. And we have our amazing moderator, Tiki. Hi everybody, I'm Tiki Love. I'm here in the Baltimore Baltimore area uh, in the state of Maryland. And I'm a library media specialist on the middle school level. I've been doing this for about 12, going on 13 years. And I love reading. I'm excited about this and I can't wait to get started with our conversation. Awesome. I'm super excited as well. So um, I guess I'll jump in and introduce myself since I'm going to be a panelist tonight. So hey, everybody, Sarah here from the DC area and uh, regional tech coordinator and ready to rock. So uh, super excited about this topic, having a background in middle school English language arts. So I'm gonna kick it right back over to Tiki to get us started. We've introduced ourselves and talked about our locations. I like to get a sense of what it was that helped to create a joy of reading for everyone. I'm not sure why I love reading. I have just always been reading. I picked up a book, um, Geez, I've been reading all of my life. I was actually reading before I started school, and that's just something that I've done. I tell people that I spent my entire first year of school in kindergarten reading every day because I could already read and do everything else the other kids were doing. So I've just been reading, and the library was kind of like my safe place. My dad was in the Army, and we moved a lot, so I was, granted, we were always all the new kids because I went to um, Department of Defense schools, but I didn't make friends well. And I always knew that I could go to the library and make a friend with the media specialist or back then the librarian and get to know that person. And they got to know me and they would suggest books. I did the junior great um, book club back probably in third grade. It was, you know, an after school book club with other book nerds. And so that's just something that I do. I, I, always have my iPad with me. Back in the day, I always had a book with me. I ended up being an English teacher, although I wanted to be a lawyer. So reading is just who I am and what I do. And it's, I think I like to read because I have such a vivid imagination. My mom used to tell me that all the time. And of course that vivid imagination caused me to tell a lie or two periodically, but, um, Reading is who I am and what I do. And if I couldn't read, I think I would be lost. Yeah, that resonated with me. Like a lot of what you said resonated with me. I want to say that uh, I, I had many similar experiences. Like I started reading very early. Um, my my whole family was kind of involved in the process. My, my mom, my dad, I, I remember like sitting down at the table with them and them teaching me how to write my letters and write different words and swap them out. Um, my grandma would uh, tell me, oh, for Papa Oscar, like that was my, my granddad's name. So I remember uh, them doing this when I was very, very young. And even my brother, who's 13 years older than me, um, when I was about two years old, and I think he started working around that time and he was working at a department store. I uh, can't remember which one, but it was it was one of the old school ones. It's no longer in existence. So uh, he um, bought me 
a video game to teach me how to read. Uh, and he had an Atari. So it was like an Atari video game. And I would go on there. And I remember like when you would press a button, a picture would come up and I would press C for clown and just start freaking out because the clown <laughs> was just so scary. But uh, I mean, it wasn't scary, but I, I thought it was scary. But anyway, so uh, just all of that, uh, just, you know, I started reading pretty early and um, preschool, kindergarten, went to school, would read books for other students. And um, all the way through school, I would read, read, read. And up till today, still reading. Um, like Leslie said, my background is in middle school, English language arts. I did that for the bulk of my career. Um, that and technology, but, um, but yeah, definitely love, love reading. So on n numerous levels, we all have a connection. Um, first off, I'm a military brat as well. My dad's a retired Marine. So we traveled every two years. And the one thing, well, two things that were constant besides my mom and dad were my books and my music. So I would always go to the go to a library, go somewhere and read a book. My mom always laughs and tells me that when I was a little kid, I wouldn't want candy when we went to the superstore or to the store. I would always ask for a book. You know, I want a book, buy me a book. And uh, my dad dad also he's a big reader he has a huge book collection and when I was a little girl he would read to me and he helped me with my reading we, we read John Saul which I probably shouldn't have been reading him at you know in the third grade but John Saul and wow this is scary dad what do you think is going to happen to he would ask me and I would you know use my imagination um, and I'm also pr previously gosh I think 10 years I was in the English classroom as an English teacher on the high school level and so I just love 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 uh, books and the interesting thing is that now that I'm in a program I I've only been focused on my schoolwork, but I was just telling Sarah earlier, you know, during the summer, I went to a conference and I was able to get back into my joy of reading for pleasure. So I'm just really, 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 really excited to talk about this this evening. You are listening to the EduMatch podcast. If you want to be somebody, if you want to go somewhere, you better wake up and pay attention. It's either now or never to make your dreams come true. You better wake up and pay attention. Hey, everybody, it's Dean from Orlando, Florida, coming to you on Monday, April 2nd, 2018. And I am very excited because today is the official release date of my first solo book titled The Why in You. Journey to the Why in You. I'm very excited that this is available on Amazon in Kindle versions and in paperback. There's your back cover right there. I am so excited because when I think about my journey as an educator, it didn't start yesterday. It started even from an early age. And so this book contains anecdotes, stories about the why in me. And so as you read it, as you pick it up, and I encourage you to do so, I challenge you to consider the why in you, the obstacles, right? That were not always positive. They were not always easy. The journey is never easy, but it is worth it. And there is something positive in every negative if you, if you can just see it. I really do believe that. There is something positive in every obstacle that if you could just see it, it will help you to continue going on that journey as an educator, as an administrator, as a teacher. Um, and so we have a job to do. And, um, and so that journey is so important to be embraced. And thank you in advance for checking it out on Amazon. Again, it's the Y in you. You can even type my name in on Amazon. It should pop it right up. You can also go to deanganey.com and find it there. Uh, you can click directly on the link and it'll take you to Amazon. Again, thanks in advance for checking it out and have a great day as well as identify the why in you. We're back. You're learning with EduMatch. Speaking about our joy of reading, what are some recent books that you've read lately that have you excited? I am currently reading a book called, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with 
technology or my job because I, I try to create a balance um, with reading for pleasure and reading for work. But the book that I'm currently reading is called The Line. And it's fascinating to me because it's written um, by a West Point grad. And that's the last duty station that my dad was at before he retired. And it has a lot of conspiracy theories about um, the Korean War and the Vietnam War and things that go on behind the scenes in government. And I'm not really much of a conspiracy theorist, but it it makes a lot of sense about how there's a lot of backroom dealings with people in powerful positions. Now, on the other hand, because I also have to read for work, I am currently reading um, the book Blended Learning because Blended Learning Conference starts this week. So Wednesday, I'm headed up to Rhode Island for that. And I want to be fully prepared because our district is going towards blended learning. And I've been doing some training to get our teachers ready for that. But like I said, I do try to read. And if my, like I, I told people before we got on air that I, I've just moved into my house and the people who helped me move were like, oh my God, who has this many books? And I would show, <laughs> and right now I don't have any bookshelves because my last place had built-in bookshelves, but I have books everywhere because there's just so many and it didn't help that the NCTE conference was in Atlanta last fall. And I went to that and I'd never been before. And oh my goodness, they give away books at that conference. They bring in authors from Scholastic and Random House and Penguin and all of these places. So I came home with even more books that I've not yet had a chance to get into. So I've got tons, I've got, I, I do a bullet journal and I've got a list of all the books that I wanna read. And um, so right now, like I said, I'm reading the line, but I balance it with something personal, something professional. I've gotten a lot of books lately from EdTech team because we're getting ready to do some training on VR and AR. So I'm reading that, but th there's no telling what I could be reading just because my interests are so varied and there's always something on my iPad that I'm, I'm currently reading. And I guess for me, um, there are like, I. I can never do like sit still and do one thing. So same thing when it comes to books, I'm reading like 50 million books at one time, like a chapter here, then I'll go to the next book, chapter here, go to the next book, chapter here, go to the next book. So right now I have my Kindle app up. Like this is how I keep pretty much all my books um, because I lose things all the time. So currently on my Kindle are book launch blueprint, the step-by-step -step guide to a bestseller. Um, and you know, the reason for that, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. I'm also reading Learning Transformed by um, Eric Scheniger and Tom Murray. I'm reading The Dandelion Woman by my friend Shelly Stout. Uh, Talented Teachers Empowered Parents Successful Students by Robert Ward, so another EduMatch uh, co-author. Classroom of One by Doug Robertson. Steal the Show from Speeches to Job Interviews by Michael Port. Um, Code Equity by Tara Linney, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Uh, so those are the ones currently on my Kindle. In addition, I've been reading a lot of um, a lot of EduMatch uh, books that are coming out. So kind of have my publisher hat on when I say this, but I'm super excited. I won't I won't turn this into an advertisement, but <laughs> I'm super excited because tomorrow the very first EduMatch solo book is going to officially launch. So that is uh, Journey to the Y and You by Dean Ganey. So super excited um, with that. What I'm excited about, one thing, uh, one book uh, that I just read about a month ago was Full Cicada Moon. So I thought that that was very interesting because the protagonist in the book, a young lady who uh, has a, um, a multicultural heritage in the 1950s, the fact that she found her voice by the end of the book, that was interesting to me. And the students and I, we talked about that when we, when we read the book for our book club. But then also, of course, I got to talk about, you know, um, Jason Reynolds. So Long Way Down, I just finished that. I think it was two weeks ago and that was really good. And I, I enjoyed it so much and I'm looking forward to reading let's see uh, Ghost and Patina so I'm going to be doing these for Project Lit with my students uh, so I, I know that they're going to love this book and we're also offering um, another Jason Reynolds book uh, yeah, a long way down for them to read that one. But then Refugee was also one thing that I wanted to read with the kids. We're not going to do this one uh, just because we feel as though the students will go towards the Jason Riddles books during testing and read it readily and we have more copies. And then the last book that I, or no, that's not it. I'm sorry. Okay, so let me save this one for last. <clears throat> I'm also currently reading uh, Black Panther Young Prince 
by Ronald L. Smith. So this is really good. It's, it gives you a point of view of young T'Challa when he's about 12, 13 years old living in Chicago. So this is a really good book and it, you know, has um, friendship and uh, dealing with a little bit of bullying and that type of thing. So that's interesting. And then this is one book I haven't started yet, but I purchased it because a lot of people were talking about it. And I was excited when I heard the story about this author Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. So I'm looking forward to reading this book. I probably won't start it until uh, midway into testing, but I'm really looking forward to this book. Oh, and you mentioned uh, The Hate You Give. Love that book. Phenomenal. And Dear Martin. Those, that's a great book, too, if you want to read that. Oh, so now that means I go to the next question. Okay, I got to focus. Um, so we've talked about books that have us excited. Uh, many in the world of education today are talking about the need that we need to offer diversity in literature. So what role, if any, does diversity in literature play in engaging our readers? I think diversity in literature is kind of like, well, it's not kind of, it is just like what we have in society. People want to see themselves in what they're reading, what they're doing. They want to they want to know that their experiences are not unique to them necessarily. Um, I remember being a child and because I was a military brat, there wasn't a lot of diversity in my class. And I've told my friends before, generally there would be four black kids in a grade level and they, were, they would put one black kid in each class. So there was no diversity. Maybe that was their attempt at diversity, but there was no diversity in our classes. And I, you know, would be like, wait a minute, you know, I need to feel connected to somebody. And although I had friends who were of different races, I still wanted to feel connected to people who had a similar to similar heritage to mine. And when we're picking out books for kids or kids are in the media center picking out books for themselves, they have a tendency to gravitate towards something that they can identify with. So we need to have that diversity in the literature so that the kids can make a connection. If they're not connected, they're not going to read. And although I taught middle school English language arts in, at the beginning of my teaching career, I ended up teaching high school English. And I would tell my children, if you're not reading outside of class, you are going to struggle on the ACT or the SAT because reading helps increase your vocabulary. And sure enough, they would, you know, oh, I'm not reading, I'm not reading. They take the test and come back. Oh, you were right. There's a lot of words on that test I didn't know. Um, so if we want to engage our children, we have to give them something that they want to read. Um, if they want to read about sports, you know, black athletes, white athletes, whatever, have something there. And when I was trying to pare down my, my book collection before I moved um, this weekend, a friend of mine was helping me move and I was going through some of the books that I used in graduate school. And I kept all of, because some of them are not relevant because I was in graduate school a while ago, but some of them aren't relevant to today. But one of the books that was on the top was, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? And she said, why do you have this? And I said, because it is a real life situation. If you go into a lot of places, they're like, all the black kids are because we're connected and it's not a matter of being, you know, racist or anything like that, but that we, we go where we're comfortable. So those are the kinds of things that I think when it, when we talk about diversity um, and I kept some on, you know, girls in the classroom, um, children of Hispanic descent, because in, in my graduate program, we, we, we wanted to make sure that we were diverse in, our, in what we read, but those are the books that I kept because I kept because those things are timeless. And we're always going to have multicultural classrooms. So as an educator, I need to know what's going on in those various cultures. Um, Leslie's two cent, actually that was more like a dollar because I talk more than my allotted time, but that's just what Leslie thinks. I love that, Leslie. I love that. And I, I definitely second what you're saying. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, people participating with us on Twitter. So we have Aaron Barnes as well as Mrs. Sparks says. So um, one 
thing that Mrs. Sparks says, I just wanted to echo in here. We have an obligation to read diverse books with our students to help them make connections to our diverse world. Reading gives us a glimpse into someone else's world and diverse literature helps us have empathy and understanding. So that was a great point, Mrs. Sparks. So thank you so much for uh, for making that point. And just to kind of piggyback off that and throw my own uh, two cents in, I think that it's extremely important to, to be representative of all kinds of characters um, in in your books. Um, so I think that uh, that one, it's important for um, for students to be able to see themselves in the books. Um, but I mean, even if the class is like homogenous, you know, like in terms of uh, diversity, and I mean that that's never going to be like truly the case. But I mean, even in even if most of your students look like one another, then it's important for them to also have a different perspective um, to the world and know that there are different kind, you know, there's different people everywhere. Everyone's uh, different and there's a world outside of what they might be experiencing. So I definitely wanted to, um, the the point about empathy and, um, you know, when you have like main characters, that's another thing. It, the main characters need to be diverse, not just the supporting characters. Um, Cause a lot of times in movie movies and TV, then you'll see, oh, you know, we have like uh, a lead character, um, but you know the supporting character can be you know a person of color, and it's just like you know we need to have books where where the main characters we have all kinds of people um, in our main character roles, so that students you know this this will help them to make sense of the world. So that's uh, that's my thoughts on that. It makes me think about first off when I was a little girl, um, I tended to read a, a series of books at a t at a time, and so I remember when I read Mary Poppins, and you know I would just imagine Mary Poppins and the children, and even though they didn't look like me, I still you know tried to imagine myself in those circumstances, or even with the series of Lion Witch in the Wardrobe or Turtle and in, in the Western Game, so I would connect with the characters in some type of way, whether it was I wanted to be like them and be more vocal because I was quiet as a kid, or because I wanted to go on their adventures. But I noticed that when I was an English teacher, a lot of my students, if, if a character that they were reading in a book, they weren't able to connect with that character, then they would just tune out and I would lose them. So I would always try and figure out a way, well, you know, even though the character doesn't look like you, what are some ways that you can connect with this character? And that was one way of getting the whole idea about diversity, because even though we might be different on the outside, we all have these similarities about things that we're going through or experiencing or our ways of dealing with it. Um, uh, obstacles in our lives. So that was one thing. But then I still see even especially a lot of the kids that I work with on middle school, they really, really, really want to have a character that looks like them. And that's what draws them in. They see that character on the cover of the book and they say, okay, I want to read this book because she looks like me or he looks like me. And that's one thing that's drawing more kids into reading. When we when they see themselves on the page, whether it's, you know, a Hispanic American dealing with issues at home or in the school or an Asian American or an African American, that's one way that they connect. And that's one way by having diversity in literature that we can connect connect with reluctant readers, especially those kids who feel like, you know, reading's just not for them. We just got to hook them in somehow. And I think by having diverse books in the collections in our school libraries or in our classroom libraries or what have you, that's one way of hooking more students into reading or kids or people, period. Because older people, they start reading books too when they see someone that they can connect with in the, on the cover of a book. Edumatch. Stay tuned. Edumatch. The Edumatch podcast will be right back. Hello, Edumatchers. This is Dr. Dorian. I am looking for someone that I can interview uh, for my class who has experience in online academies, K-12. If you have experience in teaching online classes, K through 12, please hit me up on Twitter at Dr. Roberts. You are listening to the EduMatch podcast. What are some other ways that you foster a joy of reading, especially for your reluctant readers? When I was in the classroom, I would have my children do outside reading. With my honor students, I would have them they had to read three books each semester outside of class, outside of whatever we were doing in class. And two of those books did have to come off the AP reading list. 
Although I wasn't teaching AP, I knew that when they got into the 11th to 12th grade, they would be taking AP. So I wanted them to read books off of the list so that they would be prepared to write about them. But the third book could be a book of their choice. So I would encourage them. And also, we, um, because we had so many students at our school, we would have, and I'm guessing this is probably the case at most schools, our fourth period or fifth period, whichever, depending on the year, would be an extended amount of time because that would be the, the class period that lunch would go on. And sometimes we would focus on literacy, sometimes we would focus on numeracy, but there are also times that um, I would just say everybody find a book. And I had an extensive collection of books in my classroom library, find a book and read. And um, instead of using that time to grade papers or check email, I would sit at my desk and read. And I'm thinking if an administrator comes in, they're going to say, uh, why is Ms. Fagan goofing off? I'm not goofing off. I'm modeling the behavior in my children that I want them to know that as a 40-something-year-old person, I still will sit down and read a book when given the opportunity. And one year, the English department decided that what we wanted to do was um, somebody um, made a little poster and laminated it so that we could you know, write on it and erase it. But we put what books are we, we were currently reading and we would hang it outside our door so that our kids knew that although we were English teachers and they thought that we only read the, what was required in class, we wanted them to know that outside of class we would read and that might spark an interest. I would send the kids to the media center, get a book. I made friends with the media specialist because they're, they're awesome people. They just have so much knowledge and it's, Media specialists to me have got the best job in the school because they get to see all of the kids or most of the kids and they have at their disposal so many books about so many things. And that's just, I mean, I, you, I can't say enough about why I envy media specialists. And I often think I should have been one, but I wanted my kids to know that reading is just something that you can do all of the time. You can be an athlete, but you know, at some point your body is going to say, you know what, you, you can't do that anymore. And with reading, you can do that for as long as you are capable of comprehending or if, you know, unless you have a visual impairment, but then you can go to audio books. You can read all of your life. You can read up until you just physically cannot read anymore. And you can learn so much about reading. And that's one of the things that I wanted my students to know that I'm a lifelong learner, but I'm also a lifelong reader. And those things go hand in hand because they would always say, Fagan, you know an awful lot. That's because I read an awful lot. And you too can be like Fagan, or I'm sorry, wait a minute. You, can, you too can be like the Faganator. That's my superhero alter ego. You too can be like the Faganator. All you have to do is pick up a book and read and never stop reading because you'll never stop growing. Yes, that, oh, how do I follow that answer? <laughs> but yes, absolutely. I um, I definitely agree with everything that you said. Um, I think that a great way to uh, to kind of establish that, that love of reading, um, just like as you were saying before, Tiki, um, kind of connecting it, making sure that they can um, they can see themselves, you know, uh, first and foremost, so that they can see themselves, and also really getting to know your students, um, really to getting to know what they're excited about, what makes them tick, like you said, Leslie, what they want to learn about, um, and pairing that um, with you know with the right books. Um, in addition. You know, I would I would also say, oh, before before I also say, then I'm going to go to Erin uh, had a great, great response. She said, give them purpose. I asked reluctant readers to record themselves with iPads so they could share videos with children in the children's hospital. So I thought that that was a great response as well. Um, giving them opportunities to discuss what they read is another really interesting thing. So I remember the last year where I taught eighth grade, um, then, you know, they were 13 years old. So they were, you know, totally legit with the social media thing. So after school year ended, I told them whoever would be down, then we could have uh, an ongoing book club because it was kind of like a double hook for them because they could stay connected um, to kids that they've been going to school with since kindergarten, but now you're going your own separate way. And at the same time, you're learning. And we were reading the book, The Giver. Uh, we read that at the end of the year. And then we had like the second book, Blue something, I forgot. Um, but we were 
we were starting to read that on on um on Voxer, and everyone who was interested, then I just got them a copy of the book on Kindle and just sent it over to them. So so you know, definitely having that that supportive circle that they can maybe choose their own uh, book discussion buddies, you know, and uh, and talk about it and be social and not necessarily make it all about the the you know the testing, like you know, like bringing you know, bringing the, the, the fun and the joy and the enjoyment back into it, you know, um, and not that everything we read has to be for a test, like, you know, and sometimes that just, that just kills it, but, but just bringing back like the, the fun of it. So I guess that would be mine. Bringing the fun into it, uh, definitely giving students a chance to pick their own books and choice, believe it or not. Uh, and actually I haven't had too much of a problem this year trying to convince teachers to let students pick their own books, but year just a few years ago, I had to explain to some teachers how important it was for students to be able to choose books that they wanted to read, not books that teachers wanted them to read. Um, so that's the big thing. Uh, the big, also, Leslie, you mentioned modeling, and that's so important. If you're, a lot of times, if teachers are going to give students the time to read in the classroom, they have to read as well. Like you said, you know, teacher can't sit there grading a paper, looking on their cell phone, you know, whatever. Um, so you have to model for them. Um, one thing that we offer at our school is a chance for students to take part, especially reluctant readers, to take part in a book matching service with me. So I get information about their interests, what their favorite movie or TV show is, what they like to do, what their hobbies are, and I'll give them a selection of books, whether it's fiction, nonfiction. I ask them, you know, if they prefer something that's real or something that's made up or a type of story, and I give them options, and they look through and they pick a book that might interest them, and that draws a lot of kids in because they don't think that they can really read things based on their interests. Uh, so that's really important. And then also, I think that by giving students a chance to think outside the box when it comes to reading and literacy, that helps. Because especially when um, I talk to my students about music, we like to play music in the library during lunchtime with the lunch bunch. And we'll talk about the lyrics and the music. And we'll, you know, what is this character saying? And what is the music in, or the, uh, yeah, the instrumentation saying about the the, uh, music and helping you to create a mood. And then that carries on over to, you know, when they're reading and thinking about the mood that's in the passage. So that's something that's pretty cool. Um, I just try and think, try and do things outside of the realm of what people tend to think a library media specialist should do when it comes to reading and getting kids to engage with reading. Because especially with today's learners, that's what tends to get them excited. And I just realized one more thing, ebooks, um, especially some kids, they don't, they don't like, believe it or not, and I'll do it right now. They don't like to smell new books and I just love it, but they think I'm weird when I do that. Uh, so, you know, when they get the ebook in front of them and it reads aloud to them, some of the kids really like that or it has visuals and they can just click and flip. And the idea that they can read it at three o'clock in the, in the morning on their phone, they love that. So it's just finding something that draws that, that student in or even their parent that brings them into reading and then we can build a culture of reading enthusiasts. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Tiki, for moderating that. And uh, just well done on your first moderation. Woo! <laughs> so that was that was excellent. And thank you also, Leslie, for uh, for chiming in with your insight. Today was so much fun. Thank you to everybody who was tweeting with us. Um, so great to see your insights as well. So um, just wanted to remind you all that, um, that tomorrow we are going to have the big launch day. So make sure that you follow Dean underscore Ganey on Twitter, as well as uh, EduMatch Books on Twitter. We're going to be giving away um, great, fantastic prizes from 8 Eastern all the way up until about 4 Eastern is when we're going to wrap up. And uh, next week we are going to have a um, a tweet and talk with, um, with um, Tara Gilbo. Oh, uh, and she's going to be talking about the future of education. So tune in for that. Same bad time, same bad channel. So podcast.edumatch.org forward slash tweet talk. If you want to be on panel, go to uh, podcast.edumatch.org forward slash sign up. So it's as easy as that. And um, oh, and today is April Fool's Day. So the joke is that there is no April Fool's Day episode at 7 p.m. So sorry about that. Wah, wah, wah. You know, we had to get that one in. But anyway, so everybody have a wonderful week. And thank you again for joining us. All right. Bye, guys. Edge match. It's edge match.